guys welcome back to the channel and today yes late one day but still i bring to you the review of this week's chapter of the seven deadly sins of its name the legendary weakest holy knight chapter 169 and contrary to the number on it there is nothing of naughty in this chapter well unless you consider Gota's actions to be kind of naughty which they are in a sense of the word. But the chapter begins with an argument be between Gotha and Jericho about what Gotha intends to do, what about his wish, which is to get a heart. Yes, nothing wrong on that, but it's the means to which he hopes to achieve such task. Now, the thing that's bugging me about Jericho's speech is Yes, of course, it's a totally legitimate speech. Eskinor is, a, uh, sorry, Gotha is about to face Eskinor, supposedly one of his friends. So it is not morally acceptable in any circumstance, in any circumstances, to hurt someone dear to you to obtain something, as a matter of fact, as it wouldn't be with anyone. And that's where I think that Jericho's speech fails, because it's not just hurting someone for the sake of your own objectives. It's not just hurting a friend, hurting anybody, actually. I believe that no, that barely anything can be achieved by hurting and stepping on other people. There are some more drastic situations that indeed can only be achieved like that. But I believe that in the common situations... Of course, Gota's situation is not a common situation as to start, but still, Jericho's speech, I believe, it was not that coherent when she was talking to Gota. But still, it is a totally legitimate speech and a totally legit and a totally totally legitimate argument, and she suffered the same as Gota intends to do. The only problem is. She had a heart all along, so she could understand the consequences of her actions afterwards. Gotha cannot see that. As we all know, Gotha is but an empty shell, deprived of all and any emotions. He doesn't even know the meaning of the word comrade. And that's, that's really messed up for... For a character that spent a long time with the other scenes. We can't forget that Gota was originally one of the Ten Commandments. And that's probably to do with his personality now. But I don't think it is the main precursor of his personality. Because I believe that the fact that Gota was once a, a, one of the Commandments has nothing to do with, well, it has to do in the sense that he was transformed from a commandment to an empty shell, a doll. But I don't believe that any of his personality actually trans trans transferred from that. He may have acquired some traits of his former personality later through the lack of emotions. So, go to, to me after this chapter. He kind of stood a bit lower on my consideration. Gotor was not a character that I've enjoyed from the start, from since he appeared. I had a little bit of interest in his origins, how he was so deprived of emotions. I was like, well, we've seen some empty shelled characters in others in others in other mangas, but Gotor just broke through the limit like sky high. When we found out he was a doll, it made sense. I was like, okay. So maybe, back then I theorized, maybe he was made by a powerful wizard. I imagine a sort of a Pinocchio-like story. Someone made a doll, but failed on the ultimate task, which was to give him emotions. I, I believed in something like that. And then it dropped the bomb of him being one a former Ten Commandment. Putting that together with what he did to Gillen back in the aftermath of the fight against Hendrickson, I was like, this guy is really, really messed up. And now, after this chapter, what we, what he's done with Eskinor, I'm like, okay, you stepped through the limit of the acceptable now, my dear friend. 
But I believe I still hold firm that his personality will someday be explained and either he stays on the sin side or goes back to the commandment side. I believe that Gotha's story and personality will be fully explored and fully explained so that finally we can decide whether we like him for him being a Ten Commandment and he will prove to be so and and then consequently you will leave the seven deadly sins or some change of judgment will make him stay in the seven deadly sins perhaps learn about this bad about his past as a commandment and change his ways from that time and thus staying on the shin side staying on the good guy side so to say and so Eskino actually tries to withhold from from the competition but as as Dolor states the rules are clear and so Eskino was chosen to fight and so he must fight to the death or to the end of the battle until he until neither of them can fight no more and we see how cruel the commandments are because even though he says that Gotor and Jericho are, are precious friends to him, Gloxinia just laughs and says, yes, that's what makes it fun. You humans do anything for the things you want. And sadly, this is true. If we look at the world today, we just turn on the TV and we see, even or not even the TV, we go to the internet and we see the news sites. Humans are capable of horrible 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 things in order to achieve what they consider right and good for themselves so it's it's kind of how can i say it's kind of ironic to have a fictional character of the of demonic race or well actually fairy demonic if you want to mix that in, in goxinia's case to tell something like this because it's the true. Of course, it's the author that writes this, and it's kind of the author that says this. But if you think outside the the normal box, it is ironic to think that that a fictional character actually touches on on the wound and something that's real, something that's intrinsic to the human race. So, unable to to fall from the tournament, Escanor has no choice but to face is possible defeat. The argument between Jericho and Gother continues and grows fearsome by the second. And then it comes to the time when I said that Gother doesn't even understand the concept of comradeship, of friendship. He asks, are we comrades because we walked alongside one another, because we dined together, because we fought alongside one another? And he says yet something else that's real to the human race, People sometimes use the word commerce as an excuse and then they just drop that word whenever it's not convenient to them. And he's right on a, on a certain way. Then, But then Jericho says, yes, it's an ambiguous word, but sharing feelings with people is what makes us comrades. And then it's when she touches Gotha's wound because by not having a heart, even if he wants to understand those feelings, he cannot, because he cannot feel he cannot feel them himself. And with with just his blank personality and a very very mean voice by the look of the characters, he just says that that statement makes him want a heart all the more. Just he can just so he can understand. I hope. That it's so he can understand those feelings a lot, lot better. Not convinced with the answer, Jericho tries to attack him to no result because she's easily knocked out by Gotha. Following her, Fox tries, and to no surprise, he's easily defeated. And this chapter marks the end of my fate on Hawk. For me, Hawk is no more than a mere mascot now. Is below happy level from fairy tale. In terms of mascots, for the the animes that I for the mangas that I follow now, we have Chopper, and Chopper is like the top. He's not even a mascot anymore, so it doesn't count. We have Happy, 
we have Con from Bleach. You remember the little plushie with the with the soul pill inside of him. And then we have Hawk, like scraping the bottom of the barrel, like Hawk. The name Captain of, of Scrap Squad really suits him. But anyway, Hawk, with Hawk and Jericho out of out of sight, Gota can now focus on his true target, the last target standing before him, which is Eskinaw. And he uses his magic jack on him to pull him towards him. And he, even though he says he didn't want to use his full power, he uses it. Nightmare Terror. And he forces Eskinaw into, into the, the common state of it, hallucination that comes from Gota's power. And finally, we see we see Eskinaw's past, something that I was really, really, really hoping to see ever since Eskinaw was presented, and even before that, when the when the seven were presented via those those posters right at the beginning, Eskinaw was the was a character that interested me the most. And since the special of the Vampires of Edinburgh. When I, when we when we first saw Eskinor, I was like, oh my god, is he so it's so powerful? I want to see his past. And here we have it. And apparently, he was from royal lineage. He was born a prince. From what kingdom? I wonder. Will we ever know? But it's so interesting how came how he came to be like that. How he came to to become. It's not clear in this flashback, but apparently it was during. An occasion where his big brother was bullying him and he broke his brother's arm and after that it just escalated apparently he transformed it transformed that time because his father asked why why do you look like like that people start calling him a monster even his mother even his mother denied that he was son that it was her son and with the help of someone, someone named Rosa, Eskinor managed to escape and has been running ever since. And interesting fact, this lady Rosa is very, very, very similar to another lady that has been long disappeared, has been long gone. Well, not long gone, but she hasn't appeared for a while. Our good lady Merlin from The Sins. And... This is proven when Eskinor appears again, much older now. During the day, walking around, he saves a, a, a small village, or I believe it's a village, from a monster's attack. And then he's approached by none other than, the, than Merlin herself and Meliodas. And he's like, yeah, I just love Meliodas. Merlin is like taking the lead there and Meliodas is like, yo, how are you doing? And he looks at her and he remembers himself of Rosa. And so begins his relation with the Sins. A few years later, or, well, not a few years later, but later in those memories, he asks why Merlin is not scared of him. And she says that fear is nothing more than excitement and arousal born from ign ignorance. And it kind of is. And uh, the excitement and arousal that she gets from his circumstances are way more than enough to overcome any possible fears that she could have that she could have from him. And now he ascertains himself that he really that he indeed likes Merlin. And Gotar even goes that far into making her appear just to tell him that well it's not Gotar that makes that makes thing, the hallucinations appear, but it's the people that hallucinate that. His self-esteem is so low that he actually believes that Merlin could ever say something like that to him. And listening to, to this, listening to his darkest and deepest fears, he starts to get enveloped in his own dark abyss more and more and more until it's nothing but pitch black. But, as Gotar is about to claim victory, Eskinor speaks. And he finally realizes why Merlin can't walk alongside him. It's because that 
when he was shrouding himself in his own darkness, she was ahead of him. She was illuminating his path. And we see Merlin's figure, which now looks even more like Rosa from Eskinor's flashback. And why is she walking in front of him, illuminating his path? Because that is what a son does. And to the climax of this chapter, gazing upon his own son, the prideful beast awakens. The lion's scene of pride, Eskinor emerges. And what a statement he makes. Allow me to quote, Now come little sin that takes pleasure in doing with the hearts of others. Retribution for your shenanigans will be severe. And my friends, I would advise Gota to prepare his skinny little ass and his skinny little stack of bones that he is for the greatest, most vile whooping of his lifetime. Because Mr. Eskino has awakened. And yes, predictions for the end of this battle. Let us let us finish this chapter with a bit of theory. You know how much I love my how much I love how, how much I love to make theory. Sorry about this a little mess up. Two possible outcomes for this battle. There are two, but they have several options. First, Eskinor wins. Second, Gother wins. Now, I'm, I'm going to start with Gother. Do I want Gother to win? No. Is it possible? Of course it is. Now, the only reason I would like for Gother to win is so that he could later get a bigger whooping. Because I want to see him suffer. If he ever comes to become a true sin, someone who understands feelings and friendship and anything of that, I want him to suffer a lot for what he's done before that. Only then is he, is he sort of cleansed from his old ways so that then he can he, he atone for, it, for, for his sins. Let's put it like that. Now, is, he, is there any other way he can win? Well, there is. We do not know Gotha's full extent of power, neither do we, neither do we know of Eskinos. This sort of control he now has over his curse, we do not know if it's permanent. I mean, it's not like the true sun rose. So, will he stay, can he stay for a long period of time in this form? Is he able to use it whenever he wants now? It's, these are some questions that are still left unanswered. This just happened in the end of the chapter and like that it stayed. So, second outcome, Eskinor's victory, which I believe is the most probable out of all. And since the odds were against Eskinor in the beginning, I believe it only makes sense for Eskinor to win in the end. Or not. Or things turn around and go to wins, as I said. But if Eskinor ends up winning, or even if he doesn't, I do hope, I do sincerely hope, that he's able to break every single little bone on Gota's body. If he even has bones, I do not know that. But if he does have bones on that little body of his, I do hope, I do believe, that Eskinor will break each and every single one of them and reduce them to dust. And so, to be continued on the next chapter 170, from whom that light shines. I believe it will be the end of Eskinor versus Gota fight. We might have some more sort of flashbacks in between the in between the fighting, something related to Merlin, most likely, and probably Rosa. Maybe we will know more of Rosa. As the time comes, I thought of a crazy theory about Rosa and Merlin. I, I would be capable to swear and to believe that they are actually one and the same. Now, bear with me. Imagine if Merlin is indeed Rosa, but when she was still Rosa, she was either captured or had an accident and lost her memory. Seven Deadly Sins author seems very fond of making these characters lose it, lose their memories, so it's not impossible. 
What if she lost her memory, was raised by some sort of mage, cult, or a single magician, and then she became the magician she is today, and she adopted the name Merlin, forgetting even, even, having forgotten her name Rosa. She adopted the name Merlin, or was given the name Merlin, and then began her new life as Merlin. That can explain why she looks a little bit like Rosa from Eskimo's past. It's a crazy theory, I know, it's probably not even right, but American Dream, especially when it comes to manga and, it, and its continuation, and I hope you have enjoyed this video. Please do tell me in the comment section down below what you thought about this chapter, what you think will happen in the next chapter. Do you believe Eskinor will win? Do you believe Goto will win? Why for each, for each of them? Please share your thoughts with me in the comment section down below. As I always say, she's yours to use and abuse. And I hope you have enjoyed the video. I hope you have enjoyed the commentary. And allow me once again, please, if you if you may, if you want to, please share this with your friends who like the Seven Deadly Sins fairy tale and One Piece. I know it's it's not much. It's not much of a variety. Only three mangas, but I am trying to. Put them on a good state before I can introduce any any more mangas to be reviewed. I would like to review Boku no Hero Academy, um, Akamega Kill, and so many others. I have a full list of them that, that I would that I would like to review and present to you if you don't know them already. So as time progresses, I will try to bring more and more, and of course improving the quality. So. That said, I hope you have enjoyed it, and I will see you tomorrow, finally, for the highlight of the week. As always, One Piece 822. I am really, really hoping to see that, and I've said enough. I will see you in the next video.